Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Philly Boots Rugby Roundtable. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who uh, it was actually the most downloaded podcast uh, that we've done so far. That was with the England Sevens boys. Uh, so I just really want to thank you all so much for join, uh, for downloading or watching or getting involved. And yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, and we were at a slightly later time than we would normally be. Uh, I've got a new work commitment now, so it's probably not going to be possible to do um so we'll have every other week um purely because I, it's uh it's just taken a little bit more time uh but anyway you don't need to hear about you don't need to know about me um uh, today we're going to be talking about uh the grassroots rugby scene in wales uh we did this with um scotland a few weeks ago and it was brilliant uh so now it's time um for the for the people like search to get their uh, chance to have a chat and have a rant about what the situation is and uh, all things rugby uh, in Wales. So first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Robert Reese from The Last Word on Rugby, a uh, brilliant rugby journalist. Um, and we've got Ryan Barth uh, coming on for his second appearance from uh, Full Bay Rugby Club. Uh, nice to see you, gents. Thanks for joining us. Cheers for having us on, Sean. Cheers. Uh, no, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. This should be a fun one. And if you want to get involved, um, put, uh, leave some comments in the comments bit. Uh, we'll pull them up and we'll chat through them as we go. Um, don't be shy. It's uh, it's your show just as much as it's, you know, we're talking. Um, please get involved. Uh, so, I um, honestly, I'm going to play dumb a little bit. I don't necessarily know too much about the structure of grassroots rugby in Wales. Uh, so, Robert, how about you give us a little bit of a, a, a rundown? Um, yeah, um, ultimately, if we start sort of at the top, what's below the professional level is the premiership. This is basically what a lot of people growing up pre-2000 to uh, pre would have recognised as the top clubs, you know, your Bridge Ends, Aber Avans, your Neefs, teams like that. That's what, that's the top level now at the grassroots game, but ultimately, but ultimately that they are always semi-professional. So that's just above the championship, which is where it truly goes into the grassroots. You have a blend of the semi-professional finally mixing in with amateur teams. Obviously, there's a, you know a well-known secret in Wales that's um, kind of a lot of teams are supposedly amateur, but a lot of them sort of pay, but you can't prove teams who do and teams who can't but beneath the championship it gets sort of into a sort of a bit more regional because you've got sort of you've got your div you've got your divisions in the east which basically work its way down you've got the divisions in the west and there's also divisions up the north basically it's to stop the the clubs lower down basically effectively traveling especially the clubs up north they don't ever seem to come down other than rgc who are being placed into the the premiership as they are now after working their way up but basically, you can work your way in. So the Wests and the Easts build up through there because there's a few divisions in the East, there's a few divisions in the West. They basically build their way up to the top ones there, end up going into the championship. And that's where ultimately they all meet together in, in basically what's sort of the, the blend of the best from around the country in the top two divisions. But um, yeah, that's basically the, the senior level of the game, summed up probably in a, a simplistic format, I guess. Sean, you there? <laughs> I've absolutely bored him and he's buggered off home. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I just... And you've got the inclusive clubs as well that are getting quite um, prominent, didn't they? So, as well as clubs, as like the village clubs, you've got teams for mixability, etc. Yeah. So that's probably, I imagine, an extra 30 now. No, not, not 30. In, perhaps 30 in UK, but probably about 10 in Wales. Yeah. yeah, and then add in the seconds if the clubs can manage it. So. Yeah, surprising. Like I think with the seconds, you see the sort of your more established clubs are probably the ones with the least teams and least players in many ways. You see yeah. a lot of the sort of the, the, the smaller village teams, you know, the, the division ones, twos, threes. They're the teams that actually do have you know your seconds, and some of them still do run thirds as well as the minis and juniors stuff like that. So 
I think yeah. I think the further you go down, I think in many respects the top food divisions at times have come apart from the community aspect of it. Whereas you know your actual core grassroots clubs, which are in division ones, two, three Easts, and and your Wests and up north, they they still run several teams, women's teams as well. I, it was great to see the women's and obviously the girls clusters popping up around now. I think it's great to see more, more of that being being pushed, sort of especially in the forefront of the modern game. Agree. How many women's teams are there? Sorry, I lost my connection for a second. How, how many women's teams are, uh, are in Wales? Um, I think it, you've got to you sort of go your two different ways because the way that the women's rugby has gone in Wales. It, is a weird one. That's why you've seen so many of the Welsh internationals go into the the Premiership, uh, the sort of uh, in England kind of thing. Premier Fifteen, yeah, the yeah. Premier Fifteens. So you've got quite a few people run the women's teams below in the in the in sort of grassroots community. But what's actually popping up now, instead of pushing everything through the clubs, I mean, there's there probably a fair few teams run uh, run women's and girls teams kind of things. But with the clusters coming up through, you could see it within. Um, Ebervale is they run the, the Jester to the north of the Gwent, so they sort of pulling in a lot of people. I know they uh, recently got close ties with Blind Lady stuff like that. So they they pulling the girls in a young age in these clusters. They got several age groups in in each yeah. one. And you you develop along, and then obviously when, once you've hit the sort of the senior age group, you either sort of stay in the game with your local clubs, or obviously for those who perhaps have got other things or can't commit the time, they can sort of. Sit, put it to one side kind of thing but I think I think that's the tricky thing with the women's structure in Wales is it's is all very unbalanced from bottom to the top is I, I like the way that the clusters are now integrating in, into the women's it's, it's getting a lot more girls involved and it allows them all to come together into one club makes it easier rather than each individual club's having a few girls training but I think where Wales lacks with the women is that crossover then at, at the top of the pyramid kind of thing and it stops the girls have to stop playing with the boys. I, I don't know. Is it twelve or maybe a bit older? I think, um, I think it's, it's around there. And they and they usually, from what I've seen, they've been the better players at that at that age. So <laughs> then they go. I think I'm right. They go and join like the West Wales. I think it's what the Hawks and Swansea. And then so they got rugby. And as you said, if they as they progress, they can go. The Ospreys have got a side, but there's plenty of women's teams in Swansea that haven't that have got their own. Um, state that's in their clubs like you know morrison uh, go sign in bond is uh, still quite strong just strengthened by these hubs i think yeah go ahead john yeah that's good no i was just going to say that you know, it's good that there's there's there is somewhere for them to go once they they do need that uh, team of their own as True. ryan said you know about the being can't play and after, after you know can't play with the lads after 12 it's good to see that so many clubs are popping up so ryan where whereabouts does full base sit in in the structure of um rugby in wales um full b set in division 3c um which uh in the old when i first came into seniors would have been probably division five six um uh, but progressing, we well, when it does start back, we will be aiming to, to climb. Um, we got a seconds team, which we formed, which is quite you know, which is good, obviously. Um, mainly made up of vets, yeah, yeah, definitely so, seconds, vets, um, barbarians, yeah. whatever you want to call them, and um, that yeah. So it's um, the lower level of the men's game, well, not lower level, just a division three C. So and then you've got three A. Uh, so three B, three A, Division Two, then Division One, and then as Rob said, you got the semi pro there and the championships, and there's a lot of amateur players in that anyway, and then um, the Prem, and then the regions. So down there, but still one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> On their way up. So go and so, tell us a little bit about uh, full band spoke uh, a few weeks ago on a, on a show but uh, give us sort of a quick brief history and where you are and where you're going to be yeah the history is, um, be. i've only been there coaching there for um well just over a year now but um it's such a new history so it's been quite simple to pick up pretty much all, all of their history because they were formed 25 years ago by um 
friends that lived in the Gawa. They wanted um, a club closer to them. They started playing rugby. I, I could be wrong here, but I think I'm right. They started playing touch rugby on 4B, um, the beach, the bay, and they, they went from there. So then they had a they found a pitch in the South Gower Sports Club and they played friendlies for a while. Um, they recruited quite strongly, I think, from because it's plenty of you know, farmers and players in the Gower. And then it took them a couple of years to get league status. I think they started off as a district team and then they got into the leagues then. That's where they would have started in Division 6 or 7. But with, with the league structure, instead of instead of keeping 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, they decided to change it to 3A, 3, you know, 3B, 3C, etc. So, um, yeah, in a lovely part of Swansea, yeah, I have to be honest, down in the Gower. Can't fault there. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds like I'm looking at down. players, isn't it? Recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's what we're here right. for. That's what yeah. we're here for. No. So where do you want to be? Where do you think okay. you can be? The goal in the next... Yeah, well, what's the goal in the next year or so? If we can get rugby back on. Say we can it's get rugby back, back on. Um, what, is the, what is the goal? The goal is... Um, I'll say promotion now. Uh, yeah, we, we got to aim for it. Um, from what I can see, we train as hard and as prepared as anyone around us. We train twice a week, a lot of teams. And this has been since we allowed back with COVID as well. With no games to aim for, we still get in... 15, 16, 17, 18 boys out twice a week. Um, so it's all in That's place. Good. The club looked after the players fantastically. So there's no reason really why we can't be pushing. No, we should be because we set up good enough and the players want it enough to be to climb the leagues. And with the junior section, the club's got in place. These children that are well coached now deserve to be playing the highest level they can with their village club, not leave to one of the other clubs around us who are in Division 2 and 1. Um, it'd be nice to keep them where they can get the level they want, but, but without without leaving their home club. That's the goal. Definitely. Definitely. Sounds great. Uh, and so what is, the, what is the sort of the gameplay situation at the moment? I know that there's some parts of Wales in lockdown and uh, things like that, but what is the sort of what are you allowed to do? What aren't you allowed to do? Um, what guidance have you been given from who are you? Well, well, we've been given. In fact, that. let's start, with Robert. If we can, Robert, if we can, um, sorry, if we can um, tell us what the sort of the roadmap is and what it where it is at the moment, and then Ryan will come to you and you can tell us what you can and can't do. And uh, I've seen your tweet, so you can have you can have your rant. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically the, the roadmap that started out just like anywhere else in terms of rugby, it, it progressed through. You couldn't train at all right at the you know, right through the start of the summer. It, you know, it's progressed through that you could actually start to meet up and do uh, limited group training, but non-contact stuff like that. But uh, recently, as you say, Wales have gone into uh, local lockdown, so each county borough is sort of shutting down, and the WRU decided. To that they would against the Welsh government said you could remain training in smaller groups with with the limited uh, contact, no contact stuff like that. But the Welsh Rugby Union decided that no, they was going to actually stop it completely across every county. That no one could actually go to train, and that was that. Then obviously back like it was last week, if I'm right, Caerphilly County Borough was the first to be opened back up. And I think what a lot of clubs actually found confusing that weren't in, in that borough is why Caerphilly clubs were allowed to train, but they weren't. Because realistically, while some, uh, like say Bayern and Gwent, for example, were higher in, in terms of cases than that, there was a lot of counties that were a lot lower than Caerphilly that were still in lockdown. But gradually now there's a few more counties that have been allowed. And I know, I think it was today that Bayern and Gwent clubs have been told that they're allowed to start resuming their limited contact and group numbers training. But what still makes it slightly difficult for clubs who have people from around the counties is you're still not allowed to travel for non-essential travel. So, for example, if you have to cross the right. border of a county to, to train for your rugby club, by Welsh government rulings, you're strictly not supposed to do it. So some clubs may be lower on numbers. And obviously, therefore, you're going to struggle to 
to balance it sometimes in terms of whether it is actually worth putting training on because of the get the guidelines in place. Yeah. So Ryan, how do you feel about all that? Um, confused really, because as Robert said at the start, it wasn't if it was a Welsh government guidelines, and the double and the message was put out saying, "Look, we are following the government, the leaders. They, they can't be sport, but it's not true. It's such a, it's, it's made a mockery of the fact that other sports were still continuing. They haven't stopped the football. They haven't stopped the cricket. Um, school children aren't even part of the guidelines." They don't have to social distance outside. They can be in groups of 30 outside. They can cross these borders to go to school on the school bus with all different people sitting next to them. They don't have to mask up these children, but then they can't go across the border to play rugby. Um, it was really bizarre because my daughter was, I dropped my daughter in this, um, the same village for a dance class inside a building, but my son's, my seven year old son couldn't play rugby with his mates because the Welsh Union stopped there and didn't make sense. Um, I said all the other sports going on. And a couple of things as well, which makes a grassroots coach I am, and um, I realise the importance of rugby, physically and mentally. It makes you, it's what everyone needs, not everyone needs it, majority of people, they don't even realise it. They're getting their mental strength from being... Yeah, definitely. Children as well. And what confused me then, the Ospreys community were allowed to do walk in touch. Now, I could be wrong, but I imagine most people that play walk in touch are going to be in the vulnerable category. I mean, you know, you'd have some people, young children with injury, but I've seen the photos. Most of them are elderly women and gentlemen. It's, it's fantastic. But they were back because they're not governed by the WIU. Um, I've seen the, the university team, which I found totally bizarre, tweeting that Swans University can train. Now, these these students live in house, houses of multiple occupancy. Well, they're going to be spreading it more on the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year old child. And then the worry is for me for rugby, if, like, in 4B, We've got a football club in the same venue. So that some of some of our children play football, but their friends or, or siblings play football. So they're going to join them because they're allowed. But they can't understand why can't they play their rugby on the same pitches, really, with the same same crowd? Because it's safe for the children and they've got all the measures in place. And then to seek a fairly still in lockdown, but then they're allowed. It just seems really bizarre, I think. And so it's a concern for the clubs that all, a lot of them are already struggling. The clubs that I've, put, I've been busting the gap before COVID, I've got a bit of time in the bank because they've built up their uh, strength, I suppose. And they're going to, but it, it won't go on for long. Other sports will step in and children will get bored and children will get tartened. The adults, yeah, they, they, you know, it's, it's a big yeah. picture, massive picture, especially with the mental health. Yeah. Definitely. And you've got mind on your uh, your jersey there. The charity mind. Yeah. On your mind, jersey. Mind can be tough talk. Um a team set up for mental health. Another plug. <laughs> I actually was wearing this all day. I haven't put it on just for this, but yeah, tough <laughs> talk. Mind Camry. Um yeah, it's important. <laughs> I don't think people realise that what they get from sport and uh, until it's gone, and that could be injury. And then, unfortunately, you've got to just face it as you can. But this is like, this is something that, that could be managed better. Certainly for children, because, you know, they're, they're in school playing. They're on the street playing. They're, all, they're crossing borders of schools. And, you know, there's measures in place that adults can do it safe as well. Clubs are, clubs are busting a gut to, keep, to get it going. But it was just stopped again. I don't know, it'll probably come back again and then they'll stop it again. And they can't survive, man. Like this, I think I think Ryan's got it back. Well, what it's, have you heard of around the grounds? Um, I think it's a no, similar on, picture. Robert, all you, around. you go. It is. It's a similar picture, kind of thing, all, all over. This kind of fo football is taking over as a national sport, apart from on the weekends that Wales play. That's, so, so you've got to put in this. If football has been out to play in cricket, especially coming out the summer, over the summer, a lot of kids. Play, play the two sports, play rugby and then the cricket and stuff like that. So when they come out of the winter period and the rugby training and hit the cricket season, it doesn't cross over too much. But for those who play the rugby and the football, which is surprisingly a lot, especially at the younger age, where parents want them outside getting sport done, they would they start playing football two times a week, three times a week with a club and then start going up with their mates. All of a sudden, a rugby club can lose a few, a few people, especially as Ryan said, if you share a facility or you share a ground and 
or stuff like that because and this and this has been a widespread one is it's not so much the sort of financial there is a lot of financial issues in, in Welsh club rugby but the fact that you would lose a generation of, of people who go out not just to play there's a lot of youngsters go out to watch their mates or to watch their brothers yeah. and sisters play and you know it is you know you lose that whether it be on the field or off the field and you'll never regain you never regain the large chunk of those you know we've like you say, you know, rugby was for years and years the, the national sport in Wales, and fo- football's overtaken that now. Whether people like to accept that point or not, football has overtaken it, especially with the rise of Cardiff and Swansea in, in the south. Kind of thing. When they, especially when they hit the Premiership, you, you've got a lot more people wearing f- football jerseys to rugby training than rugby jerseys to football training. And unless the WIU makes sure that these clubs can come back, then you, then you will. You'll start losing the youngsters now, and in and you will see it in 10, 5, 10 years' time when those youngsters would have been at senior level. That's a, a team that would typically have two teams, can only field one, or the, a team that may be only able to field one team at the moment is actually struggling to complete fixtures. And, and we see this right up through and even into the championship where teams don't have enough senior players to actually complete fixture lists. And obviously, then that's where uh, points deductions and things come in. And obviously, that's not ultimately what anybody wants to see for any club. No. I think is that's that's the thing is is making sure that you you keep the people in the game now at the young age so they're invested in it for years to come. Yeah, bang on. Yeah, and well, and also the 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 success of the the national football team as well is also doing well. Yeah, you know, and they're playing England tonight, so all eyeballs are on that. <laughs> um, because there isn't, you know, there isn't a world. You know, there's no rugby to watch for a few Welsh rugby games to watch for a few weeks, and if you're sort of on the edge of what you want to go and play, a game like this evening, which kicks off in a little while, yeah, you're gonna, you might be swayed, especially especially if they do one over on England, then you're gonna be swayed even more, aren't you? So. Yeah. It's you know it's it's going to be tough to to keep people in the game if there's just nothing to nothing to sort of keep them here, is there? Not really. Yeah, I think. So what I is the, what what can you do at the moment? What can if you know if you're not in a local lockdown, what training can you do? Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, yeah, Ryan. Yeah. We it was still. Um... Oh, well, doesn't matter. Well. As a coach, the only equipment we could use was um, markers, cones, I think, and um, balls. Any. Uh, still, uh, still. Still. Yeah, there's no contact in Wales yet. Um, no contact. Okay. And to be honest, I think you can have some, some fantastic sessions. And I think most coaches would agree. You've, yeah. you've done things differently and you've learned a lot more about your player skill level. I certainly have. And um, I was quite excited then to, be, to link it into when we can get back to contact. And excited again the games, even though it could be I who knows three six next September I've heard, um, but fortunately, like we still we still have boys training and they still seem to be enjoying it. So training wise, it was just we haven't gone like um, we still haven't had like, we haven't called it preseason where boys have been smashing the cardio, smashing the, you know the conditioning. We still kept it fun because people at the end of the day they still haven't got a target of a, of a league, so it's still fun. It's still skills. Um, that's all we can do anyway. But we personally haven't even called it pre-season yet. We just called it well, just get together, I suppose, and made the most of it. And it was do- it, it was go- it, it was going fine. And you see it. The clubs have all got like the track and trace uh, barcodes, sanitising hands, equipment, players, and and the children. Like, you know, even better with the under sevens. Like coach, they they just they amazing. They 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 just get on with it, and there's no complaints. And it was all fine. Players even knew themselves, you know, you could get back sorry, to touch rugby, but there wasn't any like grabbing. Everyone knew just play the game here and we're going to be helped. The fairer and the more sense you clubs are showing they were doing it, everyone was hoping, well, the WRU can see it, the Welsh government can see it. They're playing, they're playing the game here. So then to see it cut down like that with a real harsh blow to it, because it wasn't against, it was against government guidelines. I think that's what that was a disheartening thing. Clubs were behaving, players were buying into it. Players every session have to log on to the my WRU locker um, via their email or via their login to the Welsh Union site to do a, a COVID test. That's 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 tracked by coaches and clubs, and 
it was all fine to be honest. It was all common sense. It was, it was a lot safer than you would that you, you're going to get in in the rugby club bars that's still open. For example, you can't go training there, but you can go in the club for a pint. It's a bit a bit mental, isn't it? <laughs> Pardon the pun, because it is. So you can't. So, so can you can you play touch rugby at the moment? No, you can't train. Can you play football. touch rugby at the moment? No, you can you play touch rugby, rugby in in, yeah. in 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 your training sessions? Can you play touch rugby? Yes, yes, right. You can play, yeah. Non non physical contact, as in um, shields smashing, but you are allowed to actually play touch now. Yeah, just the touch rugby. Yeah, in okay. The... Yeah. So, so, what would be next on the on the roadmap? Playing, getting some sort of contact in, because it yeah. sounds like England. Here we're we're almost one step ahead of you at the moment, where we can smash into a contact pad for about ten minutes a session. Right, and that's about it. But by the talk I hear, the next you can, yeah, you can. Sorry, Ryan. No, the, the next. What I've heard is before, like say they have a um, a date in mind that we can start, they're going to give clubs a six weeks notice to get the contact in. So. That's, yeah. that's what that, so we got a, that's the next stage. I imagine they'll build that into contact on equipment and then they'll go into player on player contact. But there's going to be a six weeks build up yeah. to get the bodies used to it before we start playing friendlies. But, so, so, Robert, yeah. has there been any sort of idea of when, com- not so much competitive rugby, but uh, some sort of rugby match can take place between two clubs? Um, I think re- realistically now is, from what I was hearing, it was, it was always looking at late November, early December, but I think now everything is basically being pushed behind that the earliest you look in January of next year, as, as in any sort of reasonable game of sort of fi- or fixtures taking place, especially because, like you said, obviously the Welsh government are taking it a bit more cautiously than perhaps other governments. So I think... I. Honestly, I think I think we're going to struggle to see any sort of meaningful game time in Wales before next season. Because realistically, you know, if you start in January, you'd have to play all pretty much flat out rugby on the weekends that are free to be able to get your fixtures in and to get your meet and to get your meaningful time in. And I think players and coaches and that are mindful of this, and clubs are mindful of pushing into into cricket season and into the summer, if you want to put it like that, because, you know, people have got other other commitments once they hit that time of year. So, and you don't want to be losing and dropping off players. It's different to the professional game where players are paid by that club to stay there and they train there. You know, at grassroots level, you know, club uh, players might go out and play cricket. They might go on holidays and stuff like that. And, you know, so I think realistically, we're not looking at any full meaningful calendar ahead of next September, as Ryan alluded to earlier, I think we might see the odds localised games b- before then. I think we might see a few reaching in. I think you might see the top end of the grassroots pyramid starting back up before then, but purely on the basis that there's, there's slightly more money at most of the clubs at the top to be able to sort of get the test in done more regularly and stuff like that. But I, I think the at the first stage at the moment is getting the Welsh Rugby Union on the same page as the Welsh Government and making sure that every county can actually be doing stuff at the same at the same speed because otherwise what you'll end up having is say Caffili open up a few weeks before another county and all of a sudden the six weeks build up is Caffili are on the contact biggest part of a month before another team might be and I think that's going to be the biggest problem going forward for a lot of young players, is they're going to be out of sync with others, and you know, it's, it's, it's not always as easy to get fixtures with clubs within your area, especially if you are one of a few at a set tier within your county. Yeah, we got that problem. The rumours are that um, after Christmas, they but you know, is before there's a league set up, there's going to be like um, a mini league or many friendlies are up and you play your local sides. Have you heard the Premiership and the Championship are going to combine and the East teams and will, will um, play each other and the West and North, whatever. So, you know, they are quite close to their level. I know the Championship might struggle against some Prems, but they'll battle it out. 
and then um, same the further you go down, you play local like for four B in Division Three C. Or uh, Swansea Uplands are Division Three A. You know that's not too far from us, and the rest are Division One. Pencloud, Gowan, Gosain, and Dunvant. Those friendlies, you know, I will we, we play them and we'll get something from it, even if it's just people on the pitch and we, you know, learn where we are. But it's not going to be. I don't know. It's uh, if you're making the best of something, but as as Robert said, I think the leagues will, will be a year from now, and then that's eighteen months of rugby gone. <laughs> worse for the youngsters and worse for the old guys. Hang, with that hanging on at the end, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but there, but there, it's those different. It's, it's those guys that are the difference between getting a fifteen and not. So yeah. you want them to stick around. They well, they might feel better after having eighteen months off. Eighteen months off and eighteen months off. They might need it. Yeah, no, I think they'll definitely need it. And I think there'll be a lot of um, players that stopped. You know, thinking they'll come back, and it's always them. But once it was taken away from them, I, th- I think they thought, God, I. I do, I, I do miss this game, and they will come back. But it's the youngsters, I think, where we'll be pulled away. I want to understand it as well as a slot, the older generation. So, so what can we do as, you know, let's say we as sort of the rugby community stop that from, stop those kids necessarily just going straight to another sport? What What can we do to keep them involved, keep them um, excited, keep them uh, interested in, in the in the game in Wales. Um, it, 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 I think it just boils down to keeping them within an active game. Sort of whether that be supporting or playing. I think you just need to open. I think we just need to open things up and say, do you know what? The Welsh government is saying that we can do this. You know, we, we can get things going. Let's organise a structure to say, right. We've got a couple of months now until the new year. Say so in 2021, we're going to start up some, whether it be light contact or full contact, whatever we can do at that stage. You say, right, we'll do a light contact sort of mini friendly season to get things going. You know? and, and you keep that way, you keep the players yeah. involved in the game, you keep a player interest in the game. So ultimately, you, you, the young people are, the, are going to be the ones to lose out. You know? Technology, stuff like that starts coming out. You know, it can, the Xbox and the PlayStation 5 is coming back out now. You know, it sounds stupid, but kids are going to be on that now for the next couple of months with no rugby. All of a sudden, they're not going to be bothered about going back out on a rainy, cold day in January to play. They'd rather stay in, chat to their mates in the in the warm, where they, where they can do what they want in their own room kind of thing. And I think... Yeah, it, I'm going to get my PlayStation 1 out and play John the Lawn with rugby. Well, that's a game. <laughs> that's <for sure>. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as far as keeping the kids engaged and the adults... It, it sounds a bit corny, but if the sessions are fun, even for adults, they've got to be fun. They've got to be rewarding and enjoyable. That's the thing that has to keep going. But then, as Rob says, it's got to be some sort of competition in it because they'll get that competition from other sports. It's, you know, good clubs and good people will make it work. But it's it doesn't need to be... Like, the problem is it's been made harder than it needs to be. That's the issue. That's what it feels like. And I think at the top, they're just not getting it. Like, I read the women's Premier 15 in England are back. I don't know if they're all professional. Um, I hope they are, because they're obviously at the top of their game. But I read then in the same um, article that they're not being tested. So I was like, I can't understand. How are you having 15 women playing against 15 women who are still working or training together or whatever they do? There's no different t- to the men, and rightly so. But why aren't they being tested? So if they're safe to play, it's, I, I, just, I, I, I didn't get that either. If they're being tested, yeah, fantastic. They're going. They're on the same page as the men, but they're not being tested. It's really, it's, it's little things like that you read, and then obviously, Sean, you've seen my tweets, and as I said earlier, I read one. I read one of my own, and I was going to block myself because I'm sounded like a madman. But that's the issue for I think for a lot of people. They just can't get their head around it because it, it seems as if the job skills put in place, and it suits a lot of a. Uh, it suits a lot of people's view. There's an agenda by a lot of people that they want clubs to merge in Wales. They want it to be a summer sport. Well, they're going to get a summer sport and they will get a merger from this. Some clubs will have to join. So there'll be winners somewhere. I think. Robert, what's your view on that? Yeah, um, 
I think it's they are going to they're basically going to turn to people and say, listen, we have to start pooling resources, and ultimately it'll come down to being sort of a double a double edged sword for the for the clubs because the union will probably turn around and say, right, you're going to have to merge with someone who had this historic rivalry with or bitter rivalry with, or whatever it may be, for God knows how long. But ultimately, then what they'll still probably do is go. Listen, we're just going to bring down the funding levels and stuff like that, and, and change how we're going to treat the club system. I think what what you've got to be careful of is if you do force or push clubs into these mergers, is there's there's not enough clubs in each division as it is now. Clubs, clubs haven't got enough fixtures. You know, they, if you're playing fifteen times a year, sixteen times a year, that's that's not realistically enough for, for most clubs. You know, is you, you've got to be looking at bigger divisions. Some of these. T- the uh, leagues have got eight teams in. You know, they, they're not surviving on the on the teams and the players they have now. If you add two teams together, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a, a stronger system and, and more players within the system. You just have more players at a club, and as, as Ryan said, you will have the kids and the sort of the people who are just hanging on. If you have all of a sudden. 40, 45 people at training. You haven't got really got enough to field two teams at some clubs then. You'll have the people who are just hanging on. They'll drop out. So you'll end up with even even fewer players within the system anyway. And I think that's something that Wales needs to be careful of. Is you know, We're not England. We haven't got a player pool of England, South Africa or France to start with. You know, we've got a very low player pool despite having over 300 clubs kind of thing. And it's... I think you just got to be careful in in terms of where this to go, where this goes now. You know, you you've got to get the meaningful competition back. You but you've got to be careful how you go around it because ultimately, if you start sacrificing certain clubs, then you know you will you lose people out of the game, and that's not just players but volunteers, clubmen, and supporters too. And you know, it, it sounds yeah. stupid, but it would be a similar situation as to when clubs were supposed to join four regions twenty odd years ago, or biggest part of twenty years ago. Yeah, you're not going to have two smaller teams, village teams, say, oh, yeah, I'll be happily going to support this merged side. They, they want to keep their own team going. Yeah. And ultimately, if there's only eight players at that club, then it's going to sh- start shutting sides down. And I spoke to people at the start of the year, and this is going back to March, April, and they said, we're going to struggle if if to, to stay alive if, if this to go on through the summer. And, you know, we're... We, 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 the season should have started by now if if everything was normal and clubs are, are hanging on to bare threads. And people are leaving the game already. Yeah, big picture. Big picture indeed. And I think that's probably a perfect way to to stop it there. Um, would you come back on again and in once we know a bit more and we'll have this sort of discussion again once this uh once we know a bit more of where we are and, and what we're doing would you be up for that yeah it should be good once the wiu and bass government sort their heads out and finally know which direction everybody's going and <laughs> i'll have to check <laughs> any boost on this first if everything grows <laughs> 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 Well, look, let's let's leave it there. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope everyone watching or listening has too. Uh, we'll uh, we'll check back in in a few weeks' time once once things start moving and hopefully we get some rugby back on the pitch in Wales because uh, we all need it. We all want it. And yeah. so yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you to Robert. Thank you to Ryan. Um, and. Uh, didn't plug them halfway through, but I will do now. Uh, thanks to Rugby Store uh, for supporting the show once again. Uh, you can get 10% off any uh, any of them on the website at uh, rugbystore.co.uk and just use the promo code FYBPOD. Um, so, yeah, thank you to them. Thank you to Robert. Thank you to Ryan. Thank you to everyone watching, and we'll, uh, we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you.